these are all produced in his uh, the basement of his parents' home. Uh, his dad, who was a technician, helped him make the models and the, the socket joint puppets that he animated. And uh, some enterprising animators named Seamus Waltz and Mark Walsh and Mark Caballero approached Ray in 2002 and said, we'd like to finish it. And much to, his, uh, much to their surprise, Harry Housen said, sure. And the original figures that he had of the tortoise and the hare were literally crumbling. So these two animators uh, recreated the puppets perfectly to animate. And so that's the sixth and final fairy tale. And uh, it's narrated by uh, Gary Owens, who you probably know as Space Ghost. And uh, it was released in late 2002, and in 2003 it won an Annie Award, Animation Award. And the two animators, Mr. Walsh and Caballero, uh, formed their own animation company, Screen Novelties, which they're doing to this day. And it's a charming short. And uh, Ray Harryhausen himself uh, went in uh, at their behest and actually animated part of the, of the animated film himself. And they got a chance not only to finish one of uh, their idol's works, but he worked on it, and that was officially his last uh, animation. So that's pretty much it, and uh, I'll do my best to blab on till the equipment set up. Exactly. <laughs> Also, if you're staying for the uh, program afterwards, the uh, tribute to Max and Dave Flesher Part 2, uh, which immediately followed, uh, we're showing uh, an incredibly great Coco the Clown from 2000, excuse me, what? That'd be interesting. Uh, 1919, called The Tantalizing Fly. And then we have three of the racier pre-code Betty Boops. Snow White, Red Hot Mama, and Poor Cinderella. And we have one of the specialty films that Max and Dave did that were 20 minutes long approximately with Popeye the Sailor called Popeye the Sailor Meets Alibaba and His 40 Thieves. Then we have a, uh, another Superman cartoon, uh, which are beautifully done, from 1942, The Bulleteers. So that's pretty much uh, the program. Yeah. It was interesting to note that uh, the only reason Ray didn't finish Tortoise and the Hare was because he was uh, hired at the time to produce a beast from 20,000 fathoms. And uh, he and Charles Schneer, his producer friend, uh, said they made the mistake of selling it outright to Warner Brothers. And uh, if they'd known how successful it was going to be, because it was huge at the time, especially when tickets for 10 and 25 cents, uh, they would have uh, contained complete creative control over it. So, yes, sir. Yes, it is. I know you love this one, man. <laughs> Probably the creepiest of the uh, fairy tale stories is definitely the story of King Midas who Everything uh, he touches turns to gold. I don't want to, do, I don't want to give any spoilers away. But, uh, <laughs> it should have a playoff function. Just when you press play, it's good to go. Yeah. The volume is good.
you want any of the room lights down? Yes. Yeah, let me Dave, you're in charge of the lights over here. Kill it. Let's go. Come on. Hey, Dave. 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 Hey, Today, Ray Harryhausen is like his creation. This is Ray Harryhausen. These are some figments of his bold imagination. With these hands, this master craftsman gave unforgettable shape to figures drawn from those depths where the creatures of myth, legend, and dream reside in all of us. They have beguiled children for half a century, haunted their memories as grown-ups, and influenced generations of movie special effects artists. Today, Ray Harryhausen is, like his creations, a legendary figure. Fantasy is essentially the dream world and the magical world, and I don't think you want it quite real. You want an interpretation. And stop motion to me gives that added value of a dream world that you, if you try to make it too real. And that's the essence of fantasy, isn't it? Transforming reality into uh, the imagination. The desire to create those transformations came to him early and suddenly. He was 13 years old when he was taken to see a sensational movie at Grauman's Chinese in his native Los Angeles. King Kong, that masterpiece of stop-motion animation, instantly and permanently entered our collective consciousness and proposed his life's work to Ray Harryhausen. They had pictures of this big gorilla on top of the Empire State Building, so I got very curious, and one day my aunt gave us these tickets, and she went along with us, and my mother, and uh, I, wa I walked into Grumman's Chinese Theater, and when I came out, I haven't been the same since. The theatricality, the uh, showmanship, I just came out awestruck, and I realized what you could do with animation and it changed my life. He got busy immediately, learning the rudiments of stop-motion animation by doing. He had a natural talent for the work, as these very early examples demonstrate. At first, his studio was the family garage. Later, his father built what they called his hobby house to accommodate Ray's expanding skills and vision. And that was really the start of my experimentation. But uh, I owe everything to this giant gorilla and the people who made it. They were led by Willis O'Brien, a former newspaper cartoonist who'd been in special effects since 1914. A school friend helped Ray meet him. I called Willis O'Brien and he was very courteous and he invited me over to the studio. So I loaded some of my dinosaurs that I had made into a suitcase, took them over to MGM, and he gave me some wonderful advice. He said, your Stegosaurus's legs look like sausages and you've got to learn to develop the muscle. O'Brien inspired him to enroll in art school where he perfected his talents for drawing and sculpture, as these renderings he did for an unmade O'Brien project vividly demonstrate. When he was in art school, he also joined a science fiction club. At its weekly meetings, he made a lifelong friend. Lo and behold, there was a young writer struggling to get his stories published, was Ray Bradbury. And that was my first meeting with Ray Bradbury. He was crazy about uh, the, the Lost World, he was crazy about King Kong, and I was similarly crazy. And we made a pact together, and we said, we're going to grow old, but never grow up. We're going to stay 
18 years, 19 years old, and we're going to love dinosaurs forever. When he heard that I was reconstructing them and trying to put a film together, of course we became quite good friends, which lasted over the years. At the time, Ray was working on evolution. It was an attempt to tell the entire story of life's beginnings on Earth. And for a lone teenager, a hugely ambitious undertaking. Evolution was a 16 millimeter project, very ambitious when I look back at it. But in my naive way, I thought I could do it if I took a year or a year and a half. So I started making all of these experiments with it. And I'm very grateful I did, even though the picture was never completed, because I got discouraged when I saw Fantasia. It covered the dinosaur sequence with Stravinsky's wonderful background music. And I thought, oh, they're covering the same ground, and they did it so beautifully, I might as well abandon it. But it wasn't for naught. I used all this footage that I had experimented with earlier as a sample of what I could do. This woolly mammoth, created for evolution, is the earliest Ray Harryhausen model still in his possession. I made a few tests of it, but I never actually got to shoot it as a sequence in part of the film. But I did cut up my mother's fur coat, and uh, that was quite disturbing to some people, but I finally found out she didn't want it anymore, so I didn't get a whipping. <laughs> His father, Fred, and his mother, Martha, supported his work unstintingly and frequently collaborated with him. The dog's name, perhaps inevitably, was Kong. Through the years, they became interested in what I was doing, and they encouraged me enormously, and that was most helpful, particularly in the periods when one gets discouraged quite easily because you think you may be on the wrong track. His mammoth got a role in another uncompleted film about an alien from Jupiter. A school friend played the monster's victim. It brought him his first public recognition, a feature story in Popular Science magazine, which ran this picture. Over the years, it gradually grew from just a hobby which I did in my spare time, and it developed into a profession. My first uh, professional job, of course, was with George Powell's puppet tunes. I spent two years on the first 12 puppet tunes that he had made for Paramount. World War II interrupted his career, but not his professional development. He made this little film to demonstrate the instructional potential of stop-motion photography. He passed the war years in the Signal Corps unit, making such sequences for Army training films. One of his colleagues was Theodore Geisel, later better known as Dr. Seuss. He made this model of Geisel's snafu a comically bungling soldier for a magazine cover. Army service also perfected his scrounging skills. The Navy had thrown out all their outdated Kodachrome and just threw it out on a, a junk pile. So I, I retrieved it and had it stored away in my garage for quite a while. And when I came back from the Army, I, I didn't know quite how to use it up. So I thought, well, perhaps I could make some fairy tales for children. Mother Goose was up to date, technologically speaking, and Ray gave a hip flip to the four nursery rhymes he included in the first of what would become a short series of children's films. It took only two and a half minutes to tell the tale of a spider and the world's most famous arachnophobe. The other films in the series would devote their full 10 minutes to a single story. First of them was Little Red Riding Hood. When I started making the fairy tales after the war, my father was very helpful. He had been an engineer in the early days, and he uh, made all the armatures for me from my designs for the puppet films. 
Armatures are puppet skeletons. They're wooden or metal bones connected by ball and socket joints. This allows the puppet to hold any pose for a one-frame exposure, then be slightly changed for the next and the next. Linked together, these still shots, 24 per second, create a moving image. <laughs>
This is where they ran out of music, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Public domain music. Interestingly enough, when uh, they had to animate the character's change of expression or opening their mouth, etc., they actually changed heads with the different vowels, A, E, I, E, I, A, B, C, whatever, and uh, they put the, to put the words together. So it's pretty labor intensive, which was started at the uh, at the studios of George Powell when he did a couple things. Thank mm -hmm. you. 